I'll talk. I'll talk this time. Uh, hello, Christine. Hey. Um, you have on. A, you look a little trashy, classy today. Because oh, you really started strong with trashy, classy instead of classy, trashy. Thank you. You you have the head for it, at least the band for it. So I got uh, the headband. I'm wearing my um, Bigfoot sweatshirt. What's the what is on your little headband? What is what's the pattern? I don't know. Oh. I didn't know Blotches? if there was splotches. Oh, from here it looked like it could have been a a, a thing. So I don't know if the, if there was a thing. But no, I guess... I'm I'm a little offended. You're not impressed by my Bigfoot sweatshirt, but okay. I think I've seen you wear that before. Uh, I haven't seen this headband though. But I like both of them. You look very oh, nice. Thank you so much. Um, this was actually my LA headband that was in the LA apartment for months, and then oh, I missed it. So oh. I <laughs> stole it back. You stole, you stole it from yourself. Got from it. myself. Uh, yes. Hello. How are you, Em? I'm good and sleepy. Um, but that's usual. But I, I just, I'm sleepy because I, I stayed up late working. So I'm just, um, you know, I did it to myself. <laughs> so I really have no room to complain. But I anyway, mean, we do anyway. So it's we never stopped us before. If there's a will, there's a way, and I will find a way to always <laughs> complain about being tired when it is fully self-induced. Um, also, I you can't really tell totally, but just trust me, this room for a long time was a mess, and I cleaned it to le- yesterday, and uh-huh. I'm feeling a lot more at peace in the troll hole. Good. Um, RJ texted me. I've always wanted like friends to actually do the, oh, I'm in your neighborhood. I just didn't know if I could pop over. I've oh, always I've, wanted that's that. That's my nightmare. I know, but I've, it's, my dream would be for that to happen just all the time. And, um, you're literally the strangest person. Like, I feel like that goes against everybody's instinctual nature of like, I don't know. I'm never wearing clothes. I'm all, everything's always dirty. I always just started a Netflix show and I'm very comfy. I don't know. I grew up with, with the same group of friends and we didn't have boundaries. So I'm just used to. I also grew up in a, like a neighborhood where I, all of us knew each other really well and we didn't really care for boundaries. So I'm just used to people always walking into the house. So I <laughs> miss that and I don't have it here. And uh, RJ called me and he was like, hey, I'm, I'm heading over. Just wanted to say hi. And so that may, it forced me to finally clean the troll hole. So because it was that, his it, bedroom. Yeah. So I was like, oh, shit, I can't make it look like. Yeah. I, like his room is just the clutter room now so yeah anyway Aww, that's fun did he come over yeah he hung out oh, for good. a little bit um oh, but yeah uh, we i found out that we have the same dentist which is nice um the two of you mm-hmm. i, I didn't thought you met you and me i was like i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> unless you still come to la um i certainly don't that no would, but I, I barely br- drag myself to the dentist as is so. i asked why he was popping over and he said he was going to the dentist and i went oh where's your dentist and i was like oh that's exactly my dentist and so Aww. i i told him next time that he's there to ask olivia for the work gossip because she will give it to you so um, <laughs> oh great <laughs> anyway why do you drink christine oh um thank you for asking i actually have a very specific reason i think i think people are going to be interested i hope oh be- oh my god what <laughs> Why do you I'm, react what, like that? Why do you I, react I, like that? I am interested. I just, I'll, look, you don't act like half the time you say something I shouldn't be a little fearful of. So <laughs> I'm just bracing myself. Okay, fine. I drink because I'm going to get hypnotherapy on oh, finally. Wednesday for my phone anxiety. Oh, man. Are I'm you... so excited. I think that's also super good that you're excited because it means it's more likely to work, right? I hope so. I don't know. So the first session, um, so, okay, here's what I did, which I feel like people find this very funny. I didn't find it funny at the time. I do see the irony and I do think it'll be funny someday when when I'm hopefully no longer afraid of the phone. But at Uh the time I was like, you really put me through it, Barbara. I forgot her name. So I messaged uh, two different hypnotherapists in my area. I like filled out their online form and, you know, explained the phone anxiety and like just the, my like fear of getting on the phone and how it's just detrimental to my work and my life. And uh, the next day, my phone rings. 
And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. That is, and, there is an irony to that. I know. And like, she left a voicemail and I was like, girl, I'm not calling you back. Okay. Yeah, I'm that sorry. Was a fun Don't you little get the experiment. hint? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so like, I had jokingly even said, oh, well, if any, like the, the true test of who will be the best fit is the one that like doesn't call me. Right. And so my new hypnotherapist, she emailed me and she said, would you be more comfortable talking via email and Aww. never called me? And I was like, that's so kind. And yes, please. And so, yeah, we, we set up a, an appointment, but she said the first appointment is just to like go over any root causes of why this might mm -hmm. be the problem. And I, I don't really know. So I'm a little bit nervous about that. And then she said, if everything goes smoothly and she feels like it's a good fit, then we'll start actual hypnotherapy uh, in the new year. So I'm very excited. Oh, that's very fun. You've been wanting this for a long time. A long time. And at first it was for my needle thing, but I'm like my needle phobia. But I'm like, you know what? I you had to I'm, dive right into that one. <laughs> yeah. Like I got forced into exposure therapy. Exactly. And I feel like as insane as it sounds, I'm almost now more afraid of being on the phone than getting an IV. I think it's just because I get them so freaking often. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I, I don't know. We'll see if it works. I, I will keep everybody apprised of my progress. Uh, do you, um, uh, what was I going to say? Do you know what the, like how many sessions it takes? There's no way it's just like a one-time no, thing, right? No, I don't think so. So she said the first one is just like a sit down, like go over, you know, all the background stuff and then prepare for the hypnotherapy session. And then I think it probably takes a couple at least. Um, I feel like, I feel like you, I don't know anything about it, but it sounds like you can't just, it sounds too easy for it to work like one like time one or two time. times. I feel like it's like going to the gym. Like you have to keep practicing the muscle or something. You, of, yeah. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm very curious though. How, like if you need to re up, <laughs> do you have to like the following year, like go back or does it just fix it, you know, know or does yeah. it fix it at all? I don't know. Like we'll find out, but well, both of my parents have been hypno have had hypnotherapy at different times and it sounded like it was like a, basically a one and done thing. Yeah. Where you, oh, really? I think so. Um, then again, every time my mom went to hypnotherapy or my dad went to hypnotherapy for something, they would just like, like it was for like to not smoke cigarettes. And then they actually wouldn't, my mom, my, my, not my mom, my dad would not smoke cigarettes anymore. And then I yeah. think just for like fucking fun, he was like going, he was going to because everyone else was, even though he didn't want to do it anymore. And uh, then all of a sudden it would it's break, the, break the spell so i every time he went back it was like to correct him being stupid <laughs> so um and then my mom she had oh my god my mom is still a mess actually if if you re need a real hypnotherapist like if this one doesn't work i'll just give you the number to <gasps> the one my mom went to i remember you telling me about it but i don't remember the details oh she i don't know what her deal was for a while she was like ad addicted is probably the wrong word but she had like a real unhealthy like very very unhealthy attachment to diet coke mm. and um like she was like drinking like several cans a day like was always had one on her and i think one of her ways of trying to break the diet coke habit or just to be healthier in general um she realized she wasn't drinking a lot of water so she went to a hypnotherapist and told them that she wanted to be hypnotized to want to drink more water and to this day the anxiety attack that comes out of her if she's not even near water is really it's uh, it's unsettling it's like oh, no like it's almost like it worked too well and i like so how now, you're like this is the person you should see <laughs> i'm just saying like it's the anxiety she has without water oh, is no. definitely it's definitely different than her original behavior so if you want to see a change i <laughs> can offer did, you a like, person get what she asked for technically you know she did like i guess the hypnotist might have just probably used the wrong words or something because whatever the hypnotist said made my mom under this trance think if you don't have a bottle of water in your hand at all moments you will die immediately Jesus. <laughs> okay yeah i would say those are the wrong words it's definitely what the I wrong words but you know what it, it certainly worked and so now if she she everywhere she goes you will always see her with a bottle of water she'll really? never drink it which is the irony she'll never what? fucking drink it but she will hold it and it will always be by her side ready for her to drink oh if she God. needs okay. it the question and, that i think we're all wondering is does she still drink diet coke she does not drink diet coke wow okay i mean you know what 
it's it was very much the monkey's paw situation where she ended up like having this like really weird anxiety about water but damn it does she not run a drink diet coke yeah you know what (laughs) i guess sort of check the box you know i wonder Uh, if that means that i will just want to be on the phone all like i will literally be calling you every like like, jesus christ you've always wanted me to just like pop in or call and all of a sudden you'll be like okay i didn't mean at like eight in the morning don't call me I'm not, this isn't the time that is a good point i wonder if you getting help is actually going to be bad for me yeah so i know now i I'm know not encouraging this mental health journey you're on um no i think about like i do I, I do hope that you i know how bad your anxiety is with your phone and i feel like it gets you don't talk about it a lot or you talk about it to a point where we are aware of it, but I don't think people realize how detrimental and debilitating it is. It's so stupidly It's so, like, it's, I keep saying it's stupid and people are like, don't say that because that's not helpful. I'm sure it's not. But like, man, I just It feels stupid. It feels stupid. It feels dumb because I'm like, I, and like, I've gone, this is how stupid, okay, this is how silly it feels is that I have driven like an hour to go somewhere to talk to somebody in person instead of just picking up the phone. Like, I would rather drive to my dentist's office, walk inside and make an appointment than like call, which is so silly. And I've done that. I mean, this is not, this is not the same thing, but do you realize how silly my anxiety was that every single time I went on stage, I thought I was going to need to be upside down in front of the masses because my, I mean, like everyone's got a thing that's like, it's very validated but you feel alone in it it feels silly because yeah, it, no just one else like sees frustrating it because i'm like i know how nonsensical this is and what a waste of time and i've like it messed up business stuff i've messed up money stuff i've messed up definitely lots of medical stuff because i just i cannot pick up the like it's just the silliest thing like if people call me i will not i just will not answer i, I don't like, know poor eva has to answer the phone when we order uber eats or postmates like she's always the one who's like do you want me to call (laughs) i mean i've i've gotten very used to if i'm calling you i just text you first nothing's wrong just no 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 i don't like (laughs) and that's the other thing is like i don't have a problem talking with like you eva my mom blaze so it's not like necessarily being on i don't know what it is because i don't i genuinely don't have a problem talking to you or eva or blaze or my family infiltrated your safety zone you've (laughs) infiltrated my like family circle yeah so but but it's just anybody else who i don't know very well can't do it i um not that this i'm not trying to compare i'm trying to do the thing where i i explain how i feel like i can relate on a different level yeah i'm not trying to i'm not trying to make it about me i feel like it comes off that way when i do it but uh but I know with my ADHD, I mean, you know how bad I am with my phone. Like, you know how bad I am at responding to things. It's a, in a way that nobody else sees unless they have access to my phone number. Like, I mean, I that's an ADHD thing. I And I know what it's like to know that I need to call doctors. Oh, yeah. I know what it's like to, I need to call the bank. I need to call and my mom like back because she's called a million your times. Brain, and, like, and you're like, it's just like a constant underlying anxiety of like, Yeah, because it's like, oh, I need to do that thing. But then, oh, I've waited so long. Is it even worth now it now? It's oh, awkward. but now I've waited too long and now it's awkward. And now yeah. I need to explain myself and why I haven't responded. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. And there, there have been times where I've finally called my mom back like two months later after she's called me. 15,000 times and she's an overprotective helicopter Jewish woman. She thinks I'm dead. dead, dead. <laughs> and I have to just be like, no, I'm mentally ill. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, <there's, laughs> I, I have no, I have no excuse or like, even whenever we, I have to respond to something in our, like our own group chat and like, it takes forever. I just like, I've seen the message and there, there's, it feels like someone explained it really well. Well, now it's really derailing away from you. So um, it's fine. Go for it. There is a tick. There is a TikTok where someone did a really good explanation of like how it feels to like have like executive dysfunction of like, you know, you could put your hand on the hot stove. It's like, yeah. but like w- your brain tells you absolutely do not do yeah. that. Do not yeah. do that. Even if you have to for a million dollars, don't put your hand on the stove. That's how every task feels. And so the yeah. second that I've waited too long to respond to something, all of a sudden my brain will not allow me to just fucking fix the problem. And so I I have phone anxiety, not phone anxiety. Well, I have anxiety about using my phone after I've already fucked my own problem up. Like I'm the cause. Yeah. But so I I know what it's like to I don't know what it's like to be scared of talking on the phone like you do or to have the anxiety of talking on the phone. But I do know what it's like to feel the complete guilt after the fact of 
feeling like I ruined my own like, man, life. Like, I or made, fucked up, yeah. Or I made, more, I made more difficulties for myself because now I have to overcorrect when I could have just picked up the phone the first time. Exactly. I mean, I'm the same way with texts. I'll get a text in my, even if it's just like, hey, thinking of you, I'm like, it's too much. To, I can't respond to that right now. And then it takes yeah. like weeks to respond. And then it's like, sorry for to, the delay. And then, yeah. then they're like, oh, it's fine. And then I still don't respond. And then like two weeks later, and I've lost friendships over this. Like I've genuinely had people yeah. be like, I can't. And I understand. I'm like, I understand that like not receiving a message from somebody right away probably gives you anxiety. And I just mm-hmm. wish I could solve that, but I can't solve it. I, so really I feel hope- like my, all my friends now are like very aware that like, you know what, we're just we're going to be ships in the night sometimes and that's okay. And then we'll go on a frenzy of texting like for an hour straight back and oh, forth yeah. about something. Cause you're like, this we're is hyper the, fixating. On. This, this is the only time my brain will allow me to communicate yeah. with you. I better fucking hand. Now I that better we're do it now, now that we're talking about like, I don't know that our eighth grade religion teacher. Now <laughs> let's talk for an hour straight. Yeah. Yeah. No, anyway. but I, I can at least empathize. I can sympathize with the anxiety parks. I don't understand that, but I can absolutely empathize with the, <sighs> Uh, the the aftermath of having to like fix everything all the destruction you cause in your own path yeah isn't <laughs> I, that fun it's terrible and i i really i don't know how to get myself out of it but if I, there's a light at the I, end I, of the tunnel for you therapy if it works for you i would love to know if there's a way that that is even possible as a, i mean a, to break an adhd somebody symptom, can make you drink know. water and stop drinking diet coke which i think is a physiological addiction in a lot of people uh-huh. then i feel like this is solvable i would love to to try oh my God, to is figure this it out new year new us <gasps> wait a minute i'm not gonna say anything because i jinx it all so i'm I just know. gonna let everyone you say listening it. is like uh you you guys are no a year from now you'll be complaining about the same fucking thing <laughs> no a year from now we'll have tried hypnotherapy and then we're gonna like be even more scattered than before or something <laughs> i don't know we're gonna like to create umbrella problem like more problems branching off of all our <laughs> existing problems no if you if it's able to help you i'm i'm very happy for you because i know what Thank the rut you. feels like so um if maybe maybe in your af- after your session could you ask for like for me oh, if it's absolutely. possible no okay, absolutely cool. and I'm, I'm i mean i have a similar thing with the texting so I I want to know, you know, if if that's a possibility. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely keep you updated. Just so anyone knows what I'm drinking, by the way, I'm drinking sparkling pineapple juice beverage from Trader Joe's. So mm, it's not I, one of my vinegary kombucha things like last time. Interesting. I I was supposed to be drinking water, but I forgot where I left my cup. So <gasps> now you're going to die. Oh Linda my says. god! If it were, if I were my mother, I would be feeling like a real dry mouth problem right now, and I would start sweating and palpitating. So I can't believe it's like she has to have it on her, but she doesn't have to drink the water. It used to be. I also when I wasn't, uh, I was like a shitty little kid who didn't understand mental health at all. But I, I think uh, all of us were that. So don't worry. I, I think I. I used to think it was funny when I was a kid to like hide water from her Mm. and she would just, okay, that's just cruel. (laughs) She would just freak the fuck out. But at the time I was like, what is your deal? It's just fucking, it's a water bottle. You could get it anywhere. And she would obviously was losing her mind and probably wishing she never had me. But I, um, I, I do feel bad for her. And as I'm getting older, I, I see the panic in her eyes. If she's like, not, if she can't see a water bottle near her, it's wow. Yeah, it's wild. It's very weird. And she's that person that has like 20,000 undrank, undrank water bottles in her car because she always thinks she needs a new one every time she gets in the car, but then she won't bring the other ones inside she and drink them. She doesn't even use like a reusable one. She just uses like regular plastic water bottles. I have kind of... No, this This is not an excuse for uh, the anti-environmentalism that's happening here, but I, I think I, I pick up on a lot of my own scatterbrained slash ADHD tendencies from her, and oh. I'm starting to notice them the more I go home. And if she ever... One of my problems with having a like a go-to water cup, I'll never find it again after five minutes. I just never will. And so I've done the thing where I've tried to buy multiple cups and have a designated cup for each room so i've always got a cup nearby and then i will lose that or i'll drink it or i'll put it somewhere so i've also had to do water bottles i think that's why because i mean i think that's why there's that running joke about like our generation having like four thousand reusable water bottles because like 
I'll always think I need a new one. This one will uh-huh. fix my problem and this yes. one will help me drink more water. And then I buy it and then I leave it upstairs and then I'm like, well, now it's funky. I don't want to reuse it. And so yes. then I'm like, I'll just leave it there. Okay, well, now also- I'm at the store and they have a cute water bottle. I'm going to buy it, <laughs> which is like, isn't helpful for the environment either, to be fair. I have five personal water tumblers. I just I just decluttered all my cup cabinets. That's how I oh have my God, a number so of everything. So many cups. But um I I have five big like like the Tervis tumblers or whatever the new thing is. People don't use Tervis tumblers anymore, I don't think. I'm confused. I I, I do, but Okay. Well, I have five and I keep thinking, "Oh, I can have one in each room." But then like I'm that would the way that my brain works is every task is actually like 15 tasks. And so if that, if those 15 tasks in sequence feel exhausting, I'm not going to do the one simple task no, of because, getting myself water. Okay. That explains a lot. Cause I always beat myself up for that. Cause, but then I'm like, well, then I have to take it down. I have to go, go get it from the third floor. Then I have to clean it. Cause it's been sitting there. Then Babe, I have that's, to that's ADHD it. girl. <laughs> I know you, me. I know you keep, s- <laughs> we've been having our own private conversations on whether or not I'm not trying to bla- put you on blast here, but we've been no, having no. our own personal conversations behind podcast doors <laughs> where christine's been like you've been talking about adhd a lot and it's starting to make me wonder if i have it and every time you give me an example i'm like girl that's literally one of the fucking Sometimes main you problems you give me examples and i'm like, You're like hey, oh shit. stop watching what i do no so every task i know exactly what you're gonna say every task feels like a million it's tasks like where- a fucking mountain and i'm like why do that i have other shit to do yeah I, yeah. yeah and yeah. so and then the- i don't drink water so you know what so the water thing is like if I leave it in this room, then it collects dust. Then I feel the uh-huh. I have to wash it, and then or if it's already funky from the last time I drank it two mm-hmm. weeks ago, and keep forgetting to bring it back to the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Now I have to wash it again, but it, it just becomes so many little obstacles, and it's like, well, why the fuck would I do that when I can just grab a water exactly. bottle? Exactly. Now I have forty five fucking water bottles, and four of them are in my car, and I probably won't use them for another year when I like somehow sanitize them. Well, I I have done this, and this will be the last. We've been talking for twenty minutes about Sorry, mental folks. illness. What's new? <laughs> but um, our mental illness is that we talk about mental illness on stop. But uh, <laughs> I will say one of the, and this is going to be like a weird platform because it is kind of controversial. But I uh, I still stand by it that like I want to be good to the environment. I want to do the right thing, and I want to have like a recyclable, reusable water cup that I use all the time. But sometimes I know this sounds stupid, but that's not accessible to me. Like if mm-hmm. I'm going to drink water, some people just need water bottles because the the laundry list that becomes me, it sounds lazy to people who are uneducated about attention disorders, but to just grab my cup from a table and go clean it and fill it with water, that is actually a very exhausting obstacle for me. And mm-hmm. in the, the world of the spoon theory and all that, I don't have enough spoons to, to do that shit. I mm-hmm. don't. And sometimes the way that my brain works is i only have goldfish memory and if in the next three seconds if i can't get fucking water i'm not gonna drink it no so in terms of wanting to be good to the world i am often trying to balance that with still making my own home accessible to my needs and if having water bottles that are plastic and that sucks but like if that's the only way I'm going to get water in my body, sometimes you just got to go with the water bottle and yeah, you shouldn't feel you know, bad about it. I'll be honest, like there, there's always, I feel like given, give and take. And if, you know, say you're using plastic water bottles, well then maybe you make sure to, exactly you know, recycle or next time you go to, you don't get uh, utensils you have to throw away. You can mm-hmm. use your own or whatever. I feel like there's always give and take and you can't just like sum everything up with one action. And like the bigger thing is that, yes we should all try our best and but know. everyone has different needs and well but what i was gonna say is like yeah we all you know should try our best to do what's right but like in for the environment but ultimately like if the bigger issues aren't fixed like uh jeff bezos <laughs> you know like if if these if the you know bigger corporations aren't doing their part either then so like true. you know it's sort of frustrating because i feel like it all falls back on the individual at a certain point and yes oh, we all should try our best but like you know what everyone should be fucking trying and we should be calling like, on people to work harder anyway this is we're just being, we're all rant. no it is no but you're very right we the the very the small people the individuals are being 
one hundred percent shamed for like guilted. The, it's like so for the very for the very small fraction of damage that of we're dam- doing compared exactly. to the corporations that will refuse to do nothing. So. And like I'm like really nutty about like composting, recycling. Like I take it very, very, very seriously. And so uh, don't get me wrong. Like I'm not saying it doesn't matter and it's not important. I'm just saying at a certain point we need to stop just like shaming everybody for like the littler things and mm-hmm. you know recognize that there. are other people that should be pitching in too yeah yeah who are making anyway, us think it's our fault anyway <laughs> we've really taken on a lot of um What's soapboxes happening? today <laughs> i don't know i'm so sorry everybody i don't know what happened to either of us but we both came ready to just what like really scream on? about things <laughs> look all of those reasons are that's why we drink mm-hmm. or why we drink this week so um Cheers. anyway it, in a very large uh, shift to a completely different theme of the show. Let's talk about spooky things. Thank you. Uh, although there's nothing spookier than big cor- corporations ruining the world and blaming it on us. But <laughs> and anyway, mental illness. And Those mental are the illness. two spookiest of all. So um, sorry to everyone who's listened for 25 minutes waiting for a ghost story. Here it is, everybody. Sorry to everyone who's had to fast forward and hit 15 seconds 80,000 <laughs> times. They're the people I feel most sorry for. I feel like those people that try to skip through it know that 15, 20 minutes is the sweet spot usually. That's true. That's fair. Okay. So uh, this is a folklore kind of character today. Um, by the way, we're doing this out of order, but we should remember that this is the episode that comes out after Christmas. So I hope Whoa. everyone, I hope everyone had a very lovely Christmas. Um, and I hope you got all the presents and saw all the people that you like and didn't see all the people you don't like. And, um, I hope the table talk conversations probably about pronouns and Biden were not that terrible to, to putter through. So, and if they were, which inevitably some of them I'm sure have been. I had hope you be. had a drink in hand or a brownie in the other. Uh, oh, what a what a flower! You know, I know way not to everybody that. drinks, and for good reason. And I know it must be very difficult for those, especially who are sober, mm-hmm. to avoid alcohol in, in stressful family environments. So I hope you at least had a piece of pie on you. And if you didn't get that present you wanted really, really badly, and it like didn't even cost so much money, but you were just hoping someone would remember right. that yeah, you... Yeah, I hate when that happens. If that happened to you, and you're like, man, I just really wanted that one thing. I don't know why anyone didn't get it for me. This is my call to you. This is your sign. You deserve it after a very stressful holiday, and I want you to go treat yourself and buy yourself that Hell thing. Hell yes. And just give yourself a pat on the back, because you got through 2022, and you deserve that little thing that you're you wanted so badly. You're taking care of yourself. Treat yourself. The Merry Christmas this weekend. You go buy yourself a present after Treat all the presents yourself. you had to get everyone else. Yeah. yeah. It's not about them. Never was. Never, Never was. will be. <laughs> okay. Here's a little folklore story for you. This is the story of the Dullahan. Oh, never heard of that. I hadn't either. And I thought it was Dullahan. Found out it's Han, like Han Solo. So. Oh. Uh, so this is a figure in Irish folklore that is usually considered a fairy. But it's said to sometimes manifest instead as a ghost. So got a little hybrid situation going on. I do want to say, um, just to give a shout out to being as respectful as possible to uh, Irish communities and their um, folklore history. Um, The word fairy or fae is sometimes seen as disrespectful to um, people in Ireland. It's like disrespectful to the fairy slash fae themselves. Um, another oh. phrase you can call them is the Irish other world, which I think Whoa, is so badass. I love that. Um, I don't know if that goes for everybody, but I think it's kind of like how Appalachia has a lot of its um, superstitions. I think mm-hmm. it's I, in Ireland, it's probably also superstitious of, Hey, don't say those words. It's not, not the best. Um, they might come get you or find you or something. Yeah, so you're disrespecting the kind of the rules of the, mm-hmm. of the, so today, many people use the catch-all term she, which we talked uh, two weeks ago about uh, the Irish language and how they, the letters make no sense together in my oh. American brain. So um, she is actually spelled S-I-D-H-E, Sidhe, but it's she. Oh, you know, I thought you meant like pronoun she. And I was like, okay, so we're just umbrella pronouning <laughs> them all? Sure. <laughs> Uh, I, somewhere in there is a very hysterical r- response to you, but I don't have it. I'm not smart enough for it, but you're right. She, it's, <laughs> it sounds like a pronoun thing. Um, 
so today people instead of using fairy or fay, a lot of people use she, which means mounds, M O N D S. Um maybe I think it means like for burial mounds or ceremonial sites, sometimes it just means hills. Um, and that is said to be the entrance to the other world. Oh. But people, uh, some still at least believe that using any variation of fairy or even using the word she brings terrible luck. So they have opted for other names like the other crowd, the good people, the good neighbors, or the gentry. Whoa, the Which, other crowd. They sound so much more badass to me. I yes. feel like... I don't know why we ever didn't just start with that. That yeah. sounds so cool. Like, oh, the other world. It's like, oh my God. Okay. Gotta you go know there. who. Well, according to one of the co-founders of the Irish Pagan School, Laura O'Brien, uh, these names that they've come up with in lieu of using the other words, it's almost like a plea. Uh, it's to call them the good people or the good neighbors is almost to like imply to them. Yeah. Like, I think of you as good people. I was wondering that because you said like, oh, oh, the good people, the good neighbors. I'm like, oh, so we're just making sure they know yeah. we have no problem. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of a, a sign of respect or asking them to, to live up to the name of like, please be good people and please don't hurt us. Yeah, you're good. Remember? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's also apparently even in Appalachia, a lot of people have, um, take issue with using the word fairy. I know I'm currently using it and I, maybe that's twisted in this case, but I know a lot of people in Appalachia also have problems with using that word. And I guess they've literally called it the F word. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> and so, uh, some people in Appalachia have grown up calling them the fair folk instead of, Oh, I've heard that. Definitely. Yeah. So most people know Dullahan as more so a headless horseman, um, which is interesting interesting because it has roots in, I'll say, the other world. But the most of the stories seem to be ghost stories in some way. So um, it's an interesting tag teaming of different lore, I guess. Mm Um, some believe that the Shi are divided into two noble courts. So there's the Sealy, which are the at at the apparently it's more complicated than this, but just to keep things super basic, the Sealy are the good guys and the Unsealy are the not so good guys. Okay. Um, and also there's more complications to this too because I guess when you overlap Irish lore and like Scottish origins, um. there's debate on who how on um, like the historical crossover of the two. So, um, but anyway, what we're going to go with today is that there are two noble courts in the Shi, the Sealy, which are good, the Unsealy, which are not so good. And what's important to know is that the Shi are not, it's not just good versus evil. It's more that they don't ascribe to human morality. So they're just kind of, maybe we see them as good or evil, but they're just kind of living on their own. And um, either way, the, Dullahan is seen as a member of the unseely court. So he's technically not one of the good ones, or maybe he's just more often malevolent than others. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the Dullahan is usually well-dressed in noble man's riding clothes in nice shoes and a cloak or cape for that dramatic flair, obviously. Yeah. And the Dullahan is sometimes said to be as tall as eight feet tall. <gasps> And its horse is said to be 18 and a half hands and uh, which <sighs> horses are measured in hands. About 18 hands is the equivalent to like six feet and a horse. When it gets measured, it's not to the top of its head. It's just like basically its shoulder or its neck. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it not including its big ass head. This horse was about <laughs> six feet tall. And so. if the guy's eight feet tall and he doesn't have a head, right? Or well, neither, neither of their heads are being counted in this situation. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So both of them from neck to toe are six feet That's or eight feet tall. Scary. That, That's too yeah. tall. Their height is almost scarier than the fact that neither of them I'm are, their saying. heads are being included. So anyway, uh, yeah, that's at least 14 feet of ghost. So yikes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so when the Dullahan rides, it's creepily silent. So uh, even though you would usually hear a horse go like clop, 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 or whatever, yeah. um, can't hear a single thing. There's no, uh, buckles on the saddle. There's no, there's nothing on his outfit you're hearing. It's just weirdly eerie silent. Um, 
And sometimes it even, they think because it's so silent, he must be floating by you instead of actually writing by you. Mm. But then there are other times where he's writing so fast near you that it's known to shake the ground like thunder. Whoa. So wide range, and he picks all of the options. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's said that no one can outride the Dullahan, but you can outsmart it, Christine, with your <gasps> big, 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 big brain. I don't know about that, uh, but I'll try. Well, there's one story of a man... Fling, this was kind of an accidental uh, outsmarting him. I love but that. A man fleeing the Dullahan once, he dropped a gold coin in the road, and after a thunderous roar, the Dullahan vanished. So oh. I guess the story goes that he's either afraid of gold or got paid off to go away in yeah, some way. Yeah, or he got too distraught. Maybe he has ADHD and he was like, ooh, shiny. Honestly, he might have just been like, oh, I that reminds me I have to go do something at the bank. And they just turned around before he forgot. That- yeah. <laughs> That's what I do for Leona if she's getting upset. I'm like, look over here at this thing. So I feel like maybe I could outsmart him in I in mean, a indirect way. You could certainly outsmart me because really you could throw anything my way. And I may not be distracted at how glistening it is. I mean, I will. But also <laughs> the, it will remind me of an, another task I, ha- I was supposed to do five seconds ago. Yeah. So sure. Let's go with that. Maybe all of a sudden he was like, oh, my God, thank you for reminding me. And he like ran off to do a task before yeah, it was yeah. over. And by the way, you're so welcome. Thank you in advance. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. So uh, some think that the Dullahan is either a death omen for the near future, like oh. you're about, you're going to die soon, or he's more of a grim reaper coming to collect you in that moment. Oh, no wonder people don't like to talk about it. Especially, yeah, and to say any word other than the good people, like desperately begging, like, please yeah. be good. <laughs> please don't please hurt me. Please don't hurt me. Some stories... Um, is that some stories say that the Dullahan is not actually a she or from the fair folk, but is just truly a ghost and gets mixed in with a lot of stories of headless spirits. Okay. So um, headless spirits, uh, they're called uh, gone count. That's the the phrase. Uh, okay. And so gone count is spelled G-A-N-C-E-A-N-N. So if I'm mispronouncing anything, please let me know, everybody. But... So gone count are is the word for headless spirits. Okay. So they think the Dullahan might not be Fay or She, but maybe Gone Count. Mm-hmm. And depending on the story, Dullahans uh, can harmlessly walk past you, and you are totally like free from any danger. Or it could torment and kill you. So oh, cool, cool, cool. But it's fun to just to just hope for the best and I not think, know. So I think a lot of the stories over time have kind of implied that like based on if you're a good human or not the Dullahan's coming for you super okay. so kind of it's in my mind it's like a weird twisted santa claus story of like if you're good he won't kill you <laughs> like <laughs> yeah it sounds like very Krampusy. like he wants also, to harm the bad children right 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 it also sounds a lot like christianity like <laughs> be a good or yeah. you're gonna go to hell you're gonna burn forever yeah yeah So when he's harmless, some versions have suggested that it's because it's just a test of your humanity or a test of your moral code or some personality test. Okay. And if you pass it, it, the, this headless being will reward you or at least let you live, which in itself is a reward. Okay. Um, Thanks. If you, <laughs> yeah, thank you. I guess I was doing nothing before you got yeah, here. Yeah, what and the I guess, hell? <laughs> but if for some reason you don't pass the test or the headless horseman doesn't like you, he will punish you. Uh-huh. And in other versions of the Dullahan, it's uh, just, <laughs> this is my favorite theory, is that instead of it being a ghost or of the the other world, um, it could literally just be the ghost of, like, or instead of it being a ghost with some sort of, like, really spooky background and, like, there's a whole storyline to it. Some versions are that it's the ghost of a dude without his head, and he's just riding around enjoying freaking people out for giggles. Like, I mean, I could get behind that. If I were headless and then I and then I died, <laughs> obviously those two things go hand in hand. Um, <laughs> I, w- but, I would hope so. <laughs> oh God! If I ever do lose my head and I'm still alive, please just knock make me, sure just I'm take not me out anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll I don't want to. I don't want to live that life. I'll fix it. Um, but if I if that were to happen to me and then I become a ghost, I like to think once you're a ghost, whatever you know ailments you had are healed in the afterlife, and right. you're at least one full functioning body. If I'm still fucking headless, I've got nothing else to do for eternity. I might as well freak people out. Yeah, I agree. And like the kind of fun part about that too is that um, 
I say fun in big quotations, but the kind of fun <laughs> part about all this too is like, if you do know some shitty people from real life, like from who are alive, you really could fuck with them. Like you're like, oh yeah, you know what? I'm gonna scare the shit out of Don so and so because he really, uh, he really pissed me off when I was alive. That actually makes sense. I feel like that would um, add to the that would make sense alongside the lore of like maybe he just started out with people he didn't like and decided to punish them. And, and then reward the good like, ones. And yeah. now just he ran out of people. All those people died. So now he's now like, well, he's I guess just I'm just spying keep... on everyone, just figuring out who's who's who. Without his head, he was able to still see if he oh, were wait, naughty yeah. or nice. <laughs> great point. <laughs> great point. <laughs> so we're gonna get into some of the stories, but before uh I do, I just wanna say that piecing together uh Irish folklore is very complicated. Mm-hmm. Um after the Christianization of Ireland, many traditions were either lost completely or mm. retold through a Christian lens. Um and centuries that later. Sounds Eng- about right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Does it? Why? Yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> Uh, centuries later, English colonization also destroyed a lot of folklore traditions. So interestingly, in the 18th and 19th centuries, scholars and folk enthusiasts um, tried to record and preserve whatever lore was still out there. Oh, um, cool. But they ran into a lot of people that, I mean, it, it, when you're going through and just trying to collect stories that for centuries have been passed on through a game of telephone, um they yeah. ran to a lot of people that were either just making stuff up or had distorted details or they were combining multiple stories, pieces into one story. So the best we've got is still debatable. Um, there are a lot of stories with origins that are unknown or even if we think they're known, that could not be the case. Mm-hmm. And they're still being told as if they're authentic, ancient Irish tradition. And um, this is just a PSA that we are here to enjoy the best that we could yeah uh, that we can know but wow. other than that we'll never truly know the the, the, the just beginning so of it tragic all. you know that just, just another way that out like that just another way that religion and colonization have absolutely decimated um history <laughs> so mm, yeah it's too bad it really is too bad so one of the stories is a guy named Larry, and he is known as hardworking and sometimes hard drinking, which I would also describe Same. Christine like that. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. <laughs> uh, so Larry was out riding at twilight, and he was just kind of on his own, doing his own thing, and suddenly a woman appears beh- uh, beside his horse. Uh-oh. Which that alone... Maybe it's because I'm I'm currently watching Wednesday and I'm very primed about this, but it feels like a Wednesday Adams move to just it's appear. Like appear in yeah. silence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of which, are you watching Wednesday I right now? I haven't watched it yet. No. You'll I really like to. it. You'll really I've, like it. I've like saved it on Netflix, like to um, my list or whatever. Did you ever watch the original Adams Family? You know, a little bit, but like not, and not as much as you, you watched it, right? Like mm-hmm. through. Yeah, I never watched it through. Have you ever watched, um, or you know who like Thing is, like the yeah. hand? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so apparently Lego just came out with a set for Wednesday and <gasps> thing is literally just one of the random people hands. No, like, you know, that's like cute. The line with the little, like the, the cup, the, like the uh, Lego. Cl- yeah. What do you call this? A hook or like a, yeah, I like know what the you mean. Lego human hand. <laughs> they so literally, <laughs> they clearly just threw one that's... in the bag and they were like, I don't know. That's the thing. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best we can do. I, I actually find that kind of hilarious. <laughs> I, I feel like when your whole character is a hand, Lego should have at least tried to like m- give you a better a hand, hand than every other hand. <laughs> but I feel you like know that's who- very funny though. Like I hope they knew what they were doing. Like I hope they knew too. Because I mean that it's is very silly. That is hysterical. That's like really you could just go grab any Lego character you have, pull off its hand and pretend that was and be thing, like you know? now this is a uh, yeah, on brand. Anyway. Oh. Uh I would just I thought of Wednesday, I thought of thing, and I thought of that fun fact I like so that a lot anyway so uh he, all of a sudden this girl just like pulls a wednesday and just shows up silently next to his house next to his horse super larry says i guess he sees her out in the woods by by herself and he's like okay he says my little girl just jump up and behind me and i'll take you safe and sound through the lonesome bit of road that is before us so she gets on the horse behind him and soon after larry notices that his horse has a loose shoe so he pulls over. I don't know if that's the right phrasing he when you have a horse. Over. He turns on his blinker and he gets on the shoulder. <laughs> well, he got off the shoulder, technically. He and got then off he, the shoulder. Uh, so he pulled over with his horse and he gets off to, to look at his horseshoe. 
and this is right around the spot where the road is starting to get the darkest and spookiest for mm. the night. And the woman also hops off the horse, again, landing a little too silently and starts mm. not just walking, but gliding up the hill toward a church. Oh. Um, Larry, if we thought we were friends with him up until this point, we are no longer oh. because he tried to chase after her wanting, quote, payment for helping her. <gasps> um, and he said, what sure. Fuck? He said, sure, I've earned a kiss from your pretty <gasps> lips at and I'll have it too. Yeah. And so, and also, fucker. We're now in the darkest, spookiest part of the woods, too. Yeah, I'm going to kill him. So, she, this girl, kept moving. Uh, she looked as if she was gliding even through the thick, the rough thicket where Larry was getting like caught with thorns and in the bushes and everything. And she just seemed to be moving right through all that stuff. Good. He kept tripping over himself. And for some reason, I don't, in the story, he's also tripping over headstones and coffins. I don't know what part of the woods he's in, but okay. <laughs> Um, and he, it sounds like he just made a pit stop at your house and yeah. <laughs> he decided that he was like, you know what? I'm going to stop trying to get through all this rough, you know, bushy, all these bushes and stuff. I'm just going to wait for her to turn around and come back to me. And when, when she like turns the corner, cause we'll have met, we'll have met up by then. Oh, I see. Um, she ends up showing up again. And when she does, he grabs her <gasps> and tries to kiss her. But Sicko. when he but when he grabs her, he realized uh, earlier when she was walking by the horse, he couldn't see her face and she had her hood up. And so when she when he grabbed her this time, she had no head. Yes. Honestly, all of us wish that we could have no head when a dude's being an asshole. Absolutely. <laughs> if we could scare the shit out of anybody who's I mean, it's a dream. Honestly, now let's go back to that uh, hypothetical where I'm somehow alive and also don't have a head. If it means being like an activist and protecting all women from creepy men. To just appear when they're being targeted. Yeah. I would like to stay alive for that. Or Honestly, like to, either way, it. I will do it for sure. I love that now I somehow have to figure out whether you want me to kill you if you lose your head or just, whether you yeah. need a new purpose. You want me to help you with your new purpose in life. Maybe we just have like a like a, a debriefing first. I won't okay. be able to speak or hear you, but Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'll just like read the room and figure it out. It's I'll fine. just give me like a pen and I'll use my hand to like write out what's oh, going okay. on. Easy. Without my brain stem, I'll still be able to do everything it's like think, think and have motor functions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I think I would like to still not be here on Earth, but I can promise in the afterlife I will defend women. You will have a mission, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, thank you for that. You're welcome. I It's all. It's the least I can do. So <laughs> anyway, she has no head, and now he freaks out, and he says, well, that accounts for her not speaking. And it's like, okay, guy. Like, thank Oh, my God. This guy is too much. So he's not even apologetic. He's just, like, practically <laughs> realizing why he wasn't interested. And or why she seemed uninterested it's yeah like, and then he's like i didn't want a kiss from you anyway it's like you exactly motherfucker i like that he was thinking like oh the only reason she wouldn't have wanted me is because she doesn't yeah have a head. that's oh, the that only explains reason explains it that's the only reason she didn't seem interested in all this of this motherfucker uh so if you would if you thought that was a lot for larry to witness doesn't seem like he was really too phased by it um yeah. But shortly after, he saw a whole group of Dullahan gather around. <sighs> and in this gathering, he saw, uh, I guess he got close and personal to like the area where they live or something or where they gather. And he saw a spinning wheel with heads mounted on top of it. Whoa. And the decapitated heads were all singing together. <gasps> and, the, and the Dullahans were dancing to it. So now I'm wondering, are the heads victims that they've harmed or is it their literal it heads, their since, heads since they're headless oh my I, god can you imagine though like if dullahans actually still have access to their heads they're just actively not wearing them they're just like choosing they're just sticking them, them on spikes so they can all be in a barbershop quartet together I and mean... then and then they just dance around in a party that they're sounds like so cool the, it's it's like the the thea theatrics of it are too fun to to put aside Again, like that feels very, that's giving like Beetlejuice vibes for yeah, the afterlife for sure. of like, oh, well, if I'm not, if I can just take my head off at any moment, why wouldn't we have a secret society where Hello? we just take yeah, them all off and take sing? Take advantage of that, you know? So anyway, the Dullahan, I guess, let, let Larry feel welcomed into this gathering. They offer him a drink, but when he drinks uh, whatever they gave him, it must yeah. have been spiked in some way. 
because his own head comes off. <laughs> he so spiked d- with what spikes? <laughs> Like, what now do you that mean? is it was... clever. <laughs> what do you mean it was spiked? Like, what just? And also, like, how did it? Did it just roll off like Billy Head the Zombie? Juice? Or like, like, I don't understand. Did it? Did he just start feeling kind of like looser and he just kind of yeah. picked it up? Or like, He's did like, it? Oops! I don't did know. Did it tumble away? Was it like uh, acidic and it burned through his neck and his head fell off? I don't know. Did they grab him by the hair and just kind of do a yank for him? I don't know. Oof. Also, does that mean now he's a victim of theirs or part of the Dullahan or are Dullahan in this story great previous point. victims? Yeah, and now, great point. And now they've joined this little club of like, we were victims and now we don't have heads. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. There's so many questions. A lot of questions that people are relying on me to answer and I just don't <laughs> <Uh-oh>. have. <laughs> That's the worst just, feeling. I feel very pressured to, to, I, to be fair, up until... 24 hours ago i was not aware of this lore so uh (laughs) so anyway apparently he blacks out and wakes up in the morning and lying on the churchyard ground with his head still intact (gasps) so this feels like one of those english papers where like it's a crazy adventure and then the last sentence is like he woke up and it was a great dream it was all a dream and yeah everybody gets mad yeah exactly so that's one story there's larry another story is from cork county And it's a man named Charlie Colnane. Um, He was a horseback rider and a racer, and he stayed out late drinking one night. Seems to be a theme in these stories. Mm -hmm. Also, like, the stereotype of the Irish is like, Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sure every story starts with, I was drunk. I was having a pint, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, Charlie is riding home on one of the darkest nights he claims to have ever seen. And while it was raining, he came upon an old stone ruins of a castle. Uh Uh-oh. He realized that something, and by the way, again, it's Ireland, so I'm imagining like castles are just kind of on every block. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if that's as eerie as it is to us. Um, he I don't realized think they're on every block. I think that don't the people ruin who it. Don't own, ruin it. I don't want people to be like, you are so ignorant, you know. I'm not smart, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to intentionally I know, I know, be I know, ignorant. I know. <laughs> Well, I will say I have a feeling Ireland still has more castles than oh, the Oh, sure. US. I, yes, sure. I mean, so, I, I do find this very creepy. I think it's probably creepy whether or not. You know. Well, either way, he finds a castle ruins. Okay. And he realizes that something was following him the whole time. And I like that he was like, hmm, something. This was like his gift of fear where he was like something. <laughs> I'm on to something. What could it be? And apparently it was the disembodied head of a white horse. Oh, no. Uh, which like what hmm. please you and Gavin de Becker please tell me what is the gift of fear telling you here <laughs> when you can sense a head <laughs> is floating by itself behind you oh my god but it just kind of bumps into a tree behind you or something oh my god I don't know I guess I have to listen to his new, his forward he yeah. needs to yeah he needs to write another edition <laughs> So uh, the disembodied head of of a white horse. So it had cropped ears, flared nostrils, and huge eyes. And Charlie's horse sped up um, because obviously it was afraid of... Can you imagine the horse seeing a floating horse head? That makes me feel bad. I'm like, this poor horse is just like, I don't know what else to do. Like this poor... They're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. So the horse starts speeding up, obviously. But Mm. this head flies past them. So it's definitely faster than, than they could go. And Charlie then sees a very huge apparition of the Dullahan appear. Mm. Charlie looks him up and down and exclaims, it is no head at all he has. Which, like, why is that <laughs> shocking when you just saw a floating fucking head? You just head? saw the head. <laughs> you just saw the head, and now you're seeing the headless body, and you're like, wait a minute. Also, I love in stories when people say things out loud. When, like, yeah. in reality, does anyone actually sit there and go, oh my, yes, his head right. has been removeth from his body <laughs> I don't know. I feel like, wouldn't you just think it in your head? And Thou not? dost think the head should be connected to that headless body. But yeah, oh. I like, I love stories where it makes no sense why you're freaked out by one, but not the other. So yeah, 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 yeah. So somehow seemingly without a head, the figure l- says to Charlie, cause he said, Oh my God, a, he it has no head. The figure says, look again, Charlie Colnane. Oh, <gasps> And that's when Charlie sees that the Dullahan had been holding his own head under his arm the whole time. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. But the horse head was not being held by any horse hoof. <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, what's that about? I don't even know where the horse head figure went. That just kind of kept floating through the woods uh, by Yeah, himself. what was the point of that? Was he like trying to frighten him? And then when the horse head didn't work, he's like, fine, I'll do it. 
Yeah, I think so. Maybe he's like, I'll just manifest into something else, I guess. Oh so anyway, Charlie finds out that Dullahan had his head under his arm the whole time, giving very Headless Horseman vibes. Absolutely. I mean, literally. Literally. The head had no color to it. The skin was stretched over. Gross. Ooh. It had huge glowing eyes, dull black hair, and its mouth was stretched from ear to ear. Ew. So now this feels like a horror movie. It's grotesque. The headless person was not a horror movie to me, but the mouth from ear to ear really did it. That part is not good. The skin stretched over Ugh. it and like it sounds like a horror movie. Well, for some reason Charlie didn't um take off at this. He did not freak out. He just went he seems to not be freaked out by the disembodied heads of anything. He was fine with the yeah. horse flying through the woods. Then he sees this head that is smiling at him with glowing eyes. And he's like, I, whatever. <laughs> and he continues to ride alongside the Dullahan through the woods. Just buddy, buddy. I mean, this fucking guy. Uh, they, this is the most uh, relevant part of this entire story is that Charlie uh, apparently said they were writing in silence and he didn't know what to do or what to say. And he tried to make small talk, but it wasn't working. <laughs> <gasps> oh and my gosh, this guy. He complimented the Delahan's writing, the Delahan's clothes, and the Delahan's horse's bravery. And none of that was interesting to the Delahan. This was is like, you and okay. me like trying to talk down a ghost that's haunting us. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, well, uh, I love that collar you've got on. Yeah, and where your like, head should be. <laughs> <laughs> I really love that little green lace ribbon. Please don't Beautiful. untie it, though. Please don't untie it. <laughs> so, not interested, the Delahan tells Charlie that he has an ugly mouth. Hey, if I were Charlie, I'd be like, I'm literally trying to keep it together so Seriously. well right now. Like that really. And also like, that's the best you can do. You yeah. have an ugly mouth. That's the best you can do. I know. It's Try like, harder. well, at least I have a mouth. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. You're one to talk. <laughs> Mr. So, creepy smile. Uh, so Charlie tried again. And I guess just to like throw in a shot in the dark there said, okay, Delahan, would you like to challenge me to a race just for the fun of it? Oh. And all of a sudden... Uh, Charlie then said his only f first of all Charlie then said his only fear in challenging the Delahan was that his horse would get hurt on such a dark night and that's when oh. the Delahan seemed very interested no and the Delahan well somehow I thought the same thing that you did I was like that feels sinister but the Delahan the Delahan says will you take my word for the safety of your mare oh. and Charlie said yes and they start racing after a few moments of racing um, the Dullahan shouts out, he goes, Charlie Colnane, Charlie, stop for your life. Stop. And so when Charlie stops, the horseman declared him the winner. And here's why. Because the Dullahan tells him that a hundred years ago, in that exact same spot he had Charlie stop, he and his horse did not stop, and they <gasps> broke their necks at the bottom of the hill that they had been racing on. <gasps> oh my. The Delahan said that ever since that night, this feels like a children's book all of a sudden. The mm -hmm. Delahan says that ever since that night, they've been looking for a friend that dared ride with them. Aww. And the Delahan promised that if Charlie always remained bold, then the headless horseman would never leave his side nor his horse's side. Aww. And from then on, Charlie won every race and always credited the headless horseman. The end. Friendship. <laughs> friendship. Just the perfect blend ship. I'm I so love happy that song. Uh, so, some stories of a headless spirit, they actually come from this um, collection of stories called The Schools Collection. Mm. So, do you know about The Schools Collection? Mm, no. Okay. So, in the 1930s, the Irish Folklore Commission headed a project where they enlisted. This is where, okay. I immediately liked how it sounded with the Irish Folklore Commission that headed a project. And I was like, oh, man, they must have been taking this really seriously. Uh -oh. And I think they were trying to take it seriously. But I think you can see pretty quickly where the uh, convolution in their mm. in their research went. They enlisted 50,000 school children throughout Ireland to collect local folklore stories uh, and histories in their hometowns and kids from 5,000 schools. It is impressive. The numbers kids from 5,000 schools went around their towns and collected stories from grandparents, neighbors, etc. And some of the almost three quarters of a million pages of Irish <gasps> folklore and local tradition that they were able to get are digitized online. Some of it's wow. in Irish and some of it's in English. So, that is impressive, but I do have to say the fact that their sources are 50,000 children, I just, <laughs> I feel like, 
I don't know how they trusted them to relay the stories back to the organization. So, um, but at least they collected them at all. So I think that's it's cool. I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, they're getting them from their elders, so to speak. That's true. That's you true. Know? Uh, no, I do. I think the idea is very sweet. I just hope the kids took it seriously. Or maybe, honestly, I bet a lot of the parents and grandparents and uh, yeah. moguls were like, let me write it down and yeah. you hand it to them. You write it, then I'll edit it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I think that's really cool. Also, as one of the kids, I'd like to feel like really important after the fact of yeah, like, oh, I, bet I helped that you're published contribute in this cool. But I mean, that's really neat. Yeah. So that was one way that in the 30s they were able to collect a lot of local lore that's all over cool. again. Um, so yeah, it's very sweet. And one of the stories they got was a story from Wexford County, where a woman stayed up late um, waiting for her husband to come home. He was usually drunk, so I think she was used to having to wait for him to get back. Mm -hmm. And one night she heard a sound outside and saw a hearse driven by a headless man. And it oh. scared her so badly that she got sick and died. Well, uh, got sick and died? That's the story. Okay. And by, I think it's not meant to be like a, oh, the... The creature literally scared her to death, but it's to show how magically powerful oh, and may these I mean, beings are. Maybe it's it not that she got sick because she saw it. Maybe she, he was just an omen and she was going to get sick and die and she saw him and he yeah. was like the bringer of death. Maybe, the yeah. Grim Reaper. So that's one of the stories the kids collected. Another wow. one is a story from Limerick County. Uh, and is it a Limerick? This no, but can you imagine? Oh, come on, boo. If I knew how to just construct a limerick freestyle, I would right now for okay, you. Okay, I'll but do I... it. Oh. Tell me the story and then I'll make one. Okay. Um, okay, so <laughs> there's something called... It's, so the the entity is called the Koshta Boer. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> and it's a it's a like the spirit or the... Um, it's a hearse or a coach that it comes down one road and turns up the other. And it's always in the middle of the night. And alongside it are four headless horses and a headless coachman driving it. And anyone who sees it, uh, never does an hour's good, which makes me think like within the hour you'll be done. Oh, which is no. why the hearse is bringing itself to you. Like you see the hearse with four headless horsemen and a headless coachman and, or three, four headless horses and a headless coachman. And within the hour, you might not be here anymore. Okay, I'll try. Oh, okay. <sighs> there once was a man on a coat. No, hold on. There once was a man with no head. If you see him, you should go to bed. But if it's too late, then you better not wait. Because in the hour, you'll be dead. You will be dead. In the hour, you will be dead. <laughs> I have to work on the um, syllables. I thought you were going to say... Um, if, if it's too late, expect your fate. Oh, yeah. If it's too late, you have you've now sealed your fate. Because because in the because within the no, I got to within one single hour, you'll be dead. There you go. <sighs> I'm cop that deserves two rounds. That just my Aww. English teacher would be so proud of you. <laughs> Oh my Thank god. You. Well, um, I, that I have a weird I love limericks. I know oh, that probably wasn't even a proper limerick, but I do love like the the idea of limericks. I just think they're a cool concept. I don't know. If that ends up on a shirt somewhere in Limerick County, I need <laughs> we need to write up I a probably season probably just offended the entirety of Limerick County with that. So <laughs> sorry. I like how you just you're you're like fucking M and M. You just work <laughs> that together. It's yeah, so right. crazy. <laughs> Not to date myself, but oh my god, like I'm like hanging out with Eminem. That's crazy. Oh, what a compliment. Um, so another story. This does not involve a, a limerick. Just so you know, you're safe now. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but this is from Clare County. They the one story there is that if you see the Delahan pulling its hearse at night, it might make you walk behind it and carry the coffin yourself. <gasps> Um, I guess as a test, Ugh. the only way you are safe from this, th it's so funny, th basically the only way that you're safe from this happening to you if you come across the Delahan is if you are literally just so clueless to the situation that you don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> That's me and you. <laughs> it's If you actually see the Delahan and its hearse, if you think, oh, that's actually just like a normal funeral procession, like I should get out of their way or something, then you will oh. not be touched. But if you see it coming and you think, is that the Delahan? You're fucked. Oh, shit. So stay clueless, folks. Well, um, you just told us all, so now it's too late. Shit. Damn. Good luck, everybody. 
especially <laughs> especially in Clare County. But if you realize you are walking among the Dullahan and, uh, you know, they might try to give you a coffin to carry behind, the fear alone might kill you. So you really oh, should geez. just keep your head, keep your nose to the ground, put your AirPods in and... Just ignore just, everybody. Hey, just ignore everybody. Okay. Another story is also from Wexford County that a man heard a coach and looked out the window and saw a headless driver and two headless horses next to him. Oh, gosh. It freaked him out, and he tried to close his window so they couldn't get him. <laughs> Which, like, I wouldn't know what to do either, but I'm imagining an old 90s window, like he's rolling Cranking. it up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But the coach, the headless coach driver, caught up to him and hit him in the eyes, blinding him. What? Oh, no. Well, apparently that's a common theme that people who witness uh, these beings will get blinded <gasps> as punishment, as like, you shouldn't oh. be able to see me or don't look this at me. This is the last thing you ever saw. Mm hmm. Oh. Um, so there's another story here from Northwest Ireland in Donegal County. Um, I think this is the most accurate story. I think this is, we tried, we tried on, on, on accuracy here, but we're unsure of. If there, if someone actually has heard of the story and has a correction, please let me know. But mm -hmm. we're trying our best over here. So this is the story of Colin Goncown. And basically a rich king, which I feel like any king is rich. So, okay, a king. Uh, <laughs> he built a castle, but immediately realized that the castle was haunted and had to move out. Yeah, he built um, it, though? He like he had a castle built and uh, somehow and it's, it's haunted still haunted. Already? Oh, I boy. guess the land was really powerful. It's bad I don't luck. Know um but yeah i thought that too i was like damn like it can be built haunted that's awful um, that's a, a scary thought yeah it makes me think like oh well actually you know what i mean my parents built my house yeah. and it was haunted i was gonna say we've definitely heard stories like that even from you or like it's the land or there was a property there before or the yeah. house did used to be battlegrounds so yeah exactly i feel like that it does make some sense yeah um so Anyway, so the king moves out of this haunted house with his family, and one day, this really poor boy comes up to him and asks if he ha if the king has any shelter for the night, because he really needs somewhere to sleep. The king says that he could... It's This is a very shortened version of it, but basically the king says he could stay at the castle. Oh, um, wow. Very nice. Well, the boy asked to stay in the castle, and the king was like, I don't know about that. Oh, it's okay, good. I thought he was like, well, I have just the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Go, plebe, as we say. <laughs> plebe. Um, he said, I don't know about that. It's really haunted. And honestly, like, it's so haunted that me and my family think that you will be dead by morning if you stayed there. So please don't stay oh there. Oh, my God. And the boy was like, I really need somewhere to stay. I'm going to stay Poor there. And the, king, and the king was like, all right. I like how the king was like, I will quickly offer, I will more quickly offer that to you than just letting you stay in our guest bed because I'm a king and definitely own a guest room. Yeah. So, yeah. It's sad. So he's like, okay, I guess you can stay fine. in the castle. Suit it's fine. yourself. So the boy stayed there, and that night he saw the ghost of Colin gone Cown, and it's also known as the body without a head. Mm. The uh, the spirit, this is something that I feel like we should try next time we're in the room with a spirit. Um, uh -oh. The spirit appears and just started throwing things around the room, so very poltergeisty. Mm -hmm. And the boy didn't know what to do, so he just got up and started also throwing things around. <laughs> <laughs> that is so beautiful. He was like, I'm just going to match your energy and He's see like, what yeah, happens. Okay, cool. Two can play this game. Yeah. So he just got up and started doing the exact same thing. And uh, then the, the Colin vanished. And in the morning, the family found the boy alive. Oh, thank and God. The boy asked to stay a second night. And the king was like, dude, like you, I don't even know how you made it through the first night. Like, I don't want you here a second night. And after enough convincing, the king is like, okay, I guess if you survived oh one gosh. night, maybe you can convince, maybe you can be here another night and you'll be fine. Well, so that night, uh, the Colin appears again and started causing ghostly mischief. Um, I'm not sure exactly the details on this, but all, all I could see was that um, the boy again joins in on the fun and it basically pleased the Colin and and that was kind of the end of it the con was able to say you had passed the test i just okay. wanted someone to like vibe with i guess oh and uh, this is another common uh theme in irish stories is that the main character meets an otherworldly being and somehow passes an unspoken test yeah, which is exactly like what happened here compliment the person's um outfit and their bold the boldness of their horse and then they insult your mouth and then all of a sudden you're best friends 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, I thought I would have passed that test, but I guess I really had to say I want to challenge you and risk oh, my right. force. That didn't even do it. It was the challenge. Yeah, true. I think that was the test before the test. That yeah, Delahan, it must have been like the precursor to the test. That Delahan had like layers to his test. God, yeah. this is like a lot of, he has a lot of time on his hands. <laughs> so uh, the boy somehow survived a second night there. And when the Colin realized like, oh, this guy's pretty chill. Uh, the Colin basically said, well done, and then told him that he actually, the spirit, used to be the uh, a previous king here, <gasps> but he was very cruel to his people and was now trapped here after death until he rectified his wrongs. So instead he just threw shit around and made a mess? Yeah, you know, that's interesting. <laughs> I That's a great point. Like, okay, so you're supposed to be a better person, so... and that's the only way you're... Maybe you he wanted to stay in the afterlife. That's what it sounds like to me. It's like Yeah. Yeah. If you're if you're gonna just trash people's houses and threaten them and scare them out of living near you, you're not rectifying your it wrongs the way you think like you are. It. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it. So he told the boy that um you know, I'm trapped here, but there is one of the things that I did as a king that wasn't very good is I hid money from people and there is money and notes hidden beneath this castle. Yes. After that conversation, the Colin disappears. And in the morning, the boy told the king, hey, one, I'm still alive. And two, this is what happened last night. Uh, he tells the king about the money and the notes hidden beneath the castle. The king finds the money where the ghost said it would be. And the king, I guess, learning a lesson from the previous king who ended up being damned to eternal purgatory. Mm -hmm. The king distributes the money justly and rewards the boy. And after oh, that, good. and after that, the castle was no longer haunted. So I guess oh. it was he rectified his wrongs by at least copping up by to giving the next king a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> or yeah at least by like paying everyone back that he owed or something okay yeah i guess i could see that so yeah. the story is basically that story in on its own probably varies in a lot of ways but this all of this to say that the delahan stories they vary from people to people from county to county could be of you know part of the fair folk it could be a ghost it yeah. could be and then all those stories in between are so are so different, but the main theme is that it is to you must impress the Dalahan in some way, and thus you will be rewarded after You'll the pass fact. Their test, wow, or punished. Ha ha ha. Oh, and that's the Dalahan. I like how that one guy was just closing his window, and then he was punished for that. <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, I guess I wonder if it's like every single Dalahan has their own tests and it could make total sense or no sense or they could be like maybe like, they just decide without even they're just in a mood like the Dullahan was like you looked at me bam you, well, you looked know? at me funny you're closing your window on me you know Take there's that. like some there's just shitty people out there but there's also lovely people maybe there's just shitty Dullahan and lovely Dullahan I don't know I, I didn't say it M did oh right because you're not supposed I to think say they're, they're all lovely they're all good people good, good neighbors. neighbors the gentry yes you know, it's funny. Remember on the last after chat, we had talked about um, what I would get uh, the it was actually two after chats ago, I guess. But I talked about what I was going to get my friend's daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. They celebrate Hanukkah and we're going to their house tomorrow. And I so we went to the toy store this morning to buy her a toy. And apparently my friend told me that recently her daughter started saying she she's like three or four. And she started saying she wants to be called uh, Baby Butterfly now that's precious <laughs> and i was like that's so cute and so uh we got blaze found this like it's like a fairy door because in our neighborhood people love fairy doors that you just mm -hmm. like put on you know parts of your house and so we found like a decorate paint your own and decorate your own fairy do Aww. butter fair butterfly fairy door like it has like <gasps> butterflies on it and that's the perfect gift i was like this is so cute it's like you paint it you can um attach different designs to it and then you can put it on your house outside as a fairy door that's precious, but now you realize you have opened a door and she's going to demand to paint a new door every day. Every <laughs> Eventually their whole house is just going to be like the baseboards are just going to be caked in little houses. Oh my god, we have like six of them on our house from the people who used to live here and uh, I have not removed any of them. I feel like that would be bad luck or something. Yeah, it's weird that it almost becomes part of the architectural history. Like yeah. in a hundred years, I hope no one's touched them, but that means a hundred years and a hundred years there'll be a hundred year old fairy door on your house. I, yeah, that's true. I gotta say one of them definitely was done by like an a toddler because 
like a very little toddler with no artistic ability because it's just like a white ceramic thing and then just like splotches of brown paint on it and i was like brown this, God. yeah i was like this is what you put on my house okay fine i guess i can't touch it <laughs> that one i would take away i know i was like, like oh, how no. do i take it away by accident maybe i'll drop or maybe you know you, you could add to it maybe you could do like oh, keep yeah, this maybe i can paint it keep the splotches of brown and then add and let leona spat a new splotch and then wait the, 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 that's cute em and then the next baby and the next family that lives there that. can add a new splotch. I love that. I'm pretty I'm I feel amazing. like the kids are going to come back. Sometimes they walk by the house and they're going to be like, what did you do to my fairy door? I worked really hard on it. I'm going to be like, um, I don't know what to say, my guy. Sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> back on track. I feel like this is a synchronicity because hmm. today I'm telling you a story about the Appalachian Trail. Oh, <gasps> shut up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, hey, I'm so glad that um, that we obviously talked about this before and uh, uh, strategized. That's what yes, we do Yes, I'm every so glad we, we did that thing that we do where we really carefully we plan ahead. We debrief with our mm -hmm. heads. Yes, we make yes, sure yes. that we are doing topics that really... Uh, work speak. well together they speak yeah. well to each other yes they pair nicely i understand um so i have my gargoyles ready so oh, i am good. prepared for whatever characters you're going to throw my way to this week oh good so i know you have an interest in appalachian history and I do. Um, I do too i like especially now living in kentucky i feel like very close to it my stepdad's whole side of the family is from Appalachia and still a lot of them still live there. Oh, wow. um, so I've spent time with some of them. It's just a really cool part of the country and has quite a history. And when we were growing up, we had to learn a lot about, because we were so close to it, we had to learn a lot about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother still uses some of the lingo. There's... Oh, really? What does he call A poke is, uh, I think, what they call a bag, like a shopping bag. Mm -hmm. um there's one thing he always says it It drives me absolutely crazy but there's certain things let me see if i can find it i should have looked this up before um do you know any appalachian slang if i do i don't even think i'm aware that it's appalachia slang i don't, I don't... know if you do <laughs> they're very wild okay there's okay so the poke oh, i'm trying to think of what there's um a word for drinking Coca-Cola or something. Drinking Coke specifically? Yeah. The one I always remember is Poke. Yeah. And that's, I have I have a friend who actually went to school in Appalachia and she also uses Poke. Seriously? Mm-hmm. Whoa. Appalachia drinking Coke? I'm just going to see if it no, shows No, no, that's not it. I already tried that. Oh. I do know, isn't Mountain Dew from Appalachia? Speaking of sodas and... Um, I don't know if it's, yeah, I think it's from West Virginia. I don't know, but it's definitely very big there. I know that's a, been a really big problem. That's actually I what think, one of the documentaries was about, was about the, like, health problems from isn't, Mountain Dew. Isn't Coke um, or soda in general, isn't, I think in Appalachia it's called dope? That's what it was. Got my dope in my poke. Oh. Hold on. <laughs> Is that right? Is that what you were thinking of? Dope? I think so. I to, I'm going to wait for my brother to respond. But yes, the Mountain Dew thing was is like a big problem there. I know that. Or at least I'm, was. Gotcha. No, I remember I remember dope as soda because I thought they were talking about weed. And it didn't click for a long time. Because my friend would be like, oh, yeah, well, I'm just going to grab some dope. And I was like, you're going to just bring that out? Interesting. Like okay. I'm just curious. Yeah. So I, I there were... I don't know that much about it, about the whole area, but I, I definitely have always had a an interest and I just love the mountains and I just love, I don't know. I just love I driving know. through the area. And As someone who doesn't even like to hike, I will say Appalachia is probably gorgeous. one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. Gorgeous. But, um, but man, that is a town of hikers. That People love hiking there and I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, uh, I get that it's beautiful, but I, I, I could not live there is what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, well, I will say people like to visit to hike for sure. Like I, it's definitely known for the Appalachian Trail, which is what we will mm -hmm. be discussing. Um, okay, got it. So the Appalachian Trail was actually uh, the idea of one man in 1900. And over decades, the idea was adopted by governments, national parks, the Forest Service, until in 1937, when the trail finally connected all the way from Georgia to Maine. 
Okay. The first through hike, which is start, uh, hiking from start to finish without breaks, was completed in 1948 by Earl Schaefer. And the first woman to through hike the trail completed it in 1952, and her name was Mildred Norman Ryder. In 1987, Lori Tenderfoot Pierce became the first black through hiker to complete the trek. Oh, wow. And over the decades, the trail has like grown and changed a lot uh, as far as being affected by government policies, construction, and natural disasters, hurricanes, landslides, all that good stuff. Um, they have all affected the trail. Today, the trail is over 2,100 miles long. It takes about five to seven months to complete on average. Mm. And there is one quick footnote here. Uh, there was one wildly competitive hiker who set the record in 2018 and completed the hike in 41 days. Remember that Holy typically shit. five to seven months is the average completion how time. How did that happen? See the flash? Like, how I'll do tell you. you. Even... Okay. He had a crew following him with supplies. Oh. Whereas the previous record holder hiked alone without support. So he had like an entire like pit, pit crew basically to replenish him, give him water, help help him get through it basically. Do you know his name perchance? I don't. Okay. Uh, do you want me to look it up? No, it doesn't matter. It's fine. Why do you know him? Well, I know someone who like has been hiking for... Like, has never stopped hiking, basically. Like, hikes one trail, then just walks the other trail, then hikes the other trail, and, like, doesn't have a home. Like, he lives, he had, for a long time, he had a, a literally a, like, a mule, <laughs> like, in a oh, cart. Oh, And he just walked, um, he was, he wanted to walk across the country. Was his name Buddy? Carl Sabe. Carl Sa okay. Sabe. Never He's, mind. like, a, I think, like, a professional, professional, like, I mean, this was, like, unheard of to do this in 41 days. Gotcha. Um, well, the the guy that I'm thinking of, he dated one of my mom's friends like years whoa. ago, and but he broke up with her because he wanted to walk across the world or something, walk or, uh, something like crazy, and he actually did it, and they had, did a news segment on him. <laughs> my so. brother-in-law's uh, partner just walked uh, across the United States. Yeah, it's it took crazy. her months. She just finished, and like we saw her at Thanksgiving, and she was telling us the stories and how it works and it was just i mean she trained for months to do it yeah like it's it not something you lot. can just you can't just walk oh, out the no. door at all i'm on somehow i ended up on hiking tiktok which is the absolute opposite yeah, of what i have because i was following this couple where they're like their big thing is they're known to travel to hike massive amounts and then they like documented on tiktok for the however many months they're gone and then i fell into hiking tiktok but i i know enough about the the prep work to know that i never want to do it that sounds crazy that sounds so yes. so tough it's a lot so of tough. work uh so that was the the record holder um and you know some people probably say well he didn't really do it the right way i don't think we have at least i have the room to criticize how anybody completes the trail it's not my place nope um but if you were to to uh you know hike the trail it crosses 14 states maine new hampshire vermont massachusetts connecticut new york new jersey pennsylvania maryland west virginia virginia tennessee north carolina and georgia as mm. well as 22 native nations traditional territories wow so trey adcock of the cherokee nation writes about the relationship between the appalachian trail and native land and he believes there is a lot of work to be done still between the atc or the appalachian trail conservancy and indigenous communities and this is a quote from him what current issues are impacting specific indigenous communities with historic connections to appalachian trail land and how can the atc be a viable partner these might lead to uneasy and uncomfortable conversations, and that can be a good, necessary point of reflection for future generations. Wow. So as much as this hiking trail is very popular and, you know, an important landmark and park and so on, um, it's just important to remember that it was, you know, made right through. Uh, yeah. A lot of traditional territory. Um, and so... If you are going to do this trail, good luck because hikers face enormous elevation changes. You climb as high as 6,643 feet, mm -hmm. which is at Klingman's Dome in the Great Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. Along the trail, you can encounter potentially dangerous wildlife like black bears, snakes, and moose. But the Appalachian Trail Conservancy warns that hikers should be most worried and the most dangerous thing there are ticks that carry Lyme oh. disease. 
Interesting. I like how I like that is not something I would have even thought about where the ticks. Yep. I would have thought you about the check fucking for bears. <laughs> Always check for ticks. Uh, and it's recommended to use backwoods off. Backwoods okay. type of off uh, for bug spray and uh, bear spray as well. And not to be confused with the other, the instructions for the other product. So bear spray is not meant to be sprayed onto your body to repel bears. <laughs> It okay. is meant sort of like mace to repel a bear if it comes sure. toward you. And the bug spray does not <laughs> repel a bug when it comes toward you. It's meant to be on your body to repel the bugs. You know, maybe we need new words for them. Maybe not. I don't know. But just to be clear, um, if you spray bug bear spray on yourself, you're essentially macing yourself. So please be careful. <laughs> and actually, just don't do that at all. Please. So every year, about 3,000 people attempt a through hike, and only about a quarter of those people actually complete it, which is interesting. Yeah. I, I uh, wonder at what point they give up. So there are a couple things that people face that end up kind of stopping them in their tracks, so to speak. Oh. Bad weather, injury, illness, dehydration, and chronic wet socks, which I have heard about the wet sock seem problem. like a big deal. And then if you really think about it or experience it, would be a true nightmare. Well, it's called, is it called trench foot or trench boot? Trench foot, I think. Trench like, foot is definitely a thing. Um, it's, I think it's that started what, in World War One, like in the trenches. Yeah, but it's from your boots getting wet and yep. then your socks getting wet and then your socks and can't your dry. And your just wet all the time. It's not if you If you look up images of trench no, foot, it is out of sight. It's I'd crazy. I'd rather not. Ooh, uh, it's bad. So definitely something to consider. Get the right gear if you're going to go out. Um you know, I was talking to my brother-in-law's partner and she was saying, oh, like she was describing like when she would have to get new shoes during the during the walk. And she would go to REI, I guess, has these like used items where people you could wear a pair of shoes like around the parking lot and walk back in. And now they have to sell it at like a discounted rate because it's been used. Otherwise, they have to toss oh, it. Okay. And so they have like varying levels of um, like reusable products. And so she would go there and get like her shoes. It's just really oh. cool. Um, but yeah, people are, you need to be genuinely prepared for this kind of a hike. Oh, by the way, I haven't even told you what we're covering. We're covering <laughs> murders on the Appalachian Trail today. You know, I picked that up. <laughs> I think I picked that up. Okay. But I, we did I never like address it. I didn't it. clarify uh, at all. I just was I, like, let's talk about the Appalachian Trail. You just did like a third grade PowerPoint presentation on the trail. <laughs> this man walked it in this many days. Yeah. So I uh, tr here's my, uh, I'm going to custom animation a picture of trench foot. It's going to like spin around until it gets onto the, <laughs> the screen. All of a sudden the trench foot and then there's like a sound effect of it like kicking you in the face. Yeah, poo, poo. <laughs> All right. So focused on bears and thunderstorms, plenty of hikers might not consider that other hikers seemingly just like them might also be risk factors. Mm. Since 1974, there have been at least 13 documented murders on the Appalachian Trail. Oh. Now, if you're really thinking about it, the statistics make it pretty clear that it's much more likely that you would be harmed by some other ailment than a murderer on the trail but it has happened um violent crime is not common on the appalachian trail in fact you're about 10 times more likely to be murdered in chicago than on the appalachian trail oh. that is 10 times more likely so instead there is this element of fear of being in the isolated woods being alone being in the dark being in some force majeure <laughs> yeah like you never know i mean they're they're definitely are added elements of being in the woods that are scarier in some ways than being in a big city. But typically the violence is more likely to happen in an urban environment. Mm -hmm. So the first story we're going to, I'm going to talk about two murders. Uh, this first one happened in 1974 and it was the first Appalachian trail killing. Okay. So 26 year old Joel Eugene Polson and 18 year old Margaret McFadden Harrett had only recently met in 1974 when Margaret introduced Joel to her parents and told them a bit of a white lie. Uh oh. She hadn't known him long, but she really trusted Joel and admired his adventurous spirit, but she knew her parents would never let her take off into the woods with some guy she just met, especially sure. considering he was like, eight years older than her she was only 18 mm. so instead margaret told her parents that joel was actually leading a group of 15 college students along the appalachian trail and she was one of those 15 college students mm. 
She okay. lied because it was just the two of them going on this trip together. Oh, okay. Yep. Noted. So Margaret's childhood best friend remembers, I can remember sitting in her front yard and her telling me about the trip. I'm sure I knew about the trail, but I'd never known anyone who did that kind of stuff. So May 9th, 1974, Joel and Margaret set off, just the two of them, from Springer Mountain in Georgia, which is the southern terminus of the trail. And Margaret was a new hiker. Uh, Joel actually wasn't really a veteran hiker himself. And after six miles of intense incline, they decided to stop at the low gap shelter for the night. Mm. Now, when you're on these kind of trails, and this is something I heard from, uh, I'm going to, her name's Emily. I'm just going to call her Emily, uh, who did this, who did her long cross country walk, um, is that you encounter other hikers. And that's kind of how you have social interaction how you get information about other hikers you just like connect with people as you're walking the trail you see them and then you lose them and you see them again it's just how it works so it's not uncommon to share shelters with other hikers on any trail so joel and margaret were unsurprised to run into 31 year old ralph fox howard at the lower gap shelter that evening um The weird thing, and this is where Gift of Fear comes in handy, they noticed he didn't look like a hiker. Ew. Immediately. Yeah. (laughs) Big red flag. He was in everyday shoes. He didn't have many supplies. He wasn't really dressed for cold or rain, and he only Mm. had a single canvas backpack. Okay. Yeah. No, that he's out of place for sure. Yes. Out of place. He introduced himself to the couple casually enough, but Joel told Margaret that Ralph made him uneasy. Mm Mm-hmm. He said they should get an early start in the morning and eat breakfast further up the trail, and Margaret totally agreed. So that night went pretty smoothly. They passed the night quietly together, all three of them. But early in the morning, Joel woke Margaret up and said, come on, let's go. I'll be outside getting ready. So Margaret was lacing up her boots in the shelter when she heard what she called a sharp noise. It was a gunshot. (gasps) Ralph had shot Joel outside the shelter, just in cold blood. Oh, my God. So Margaret at first didn't quite understand what had happened. I imagine that would be a very turbulent and confusing moment. And so she didn't realize that Joel was dead. Uh, As Ralph led her into the woods at gunpoint, she asked him to move Joel away from the fire ring so that he wouldn't get burned because he was like he had been shot right by the fire ring. Jeez. So Ralph blindfolded Margaret and tied her up to a tree. And then he left for a few minutes. And when he came back, he told Margaret he, quote, took care of Joel. Oh, geez. He ransacked Joel's bag, stealing his traveler's checks. And then Ralph told Margaret he was leaving her there. (laughs) He gave her some water, a bag of granola and a wristwatch. And he told her he'd leave a note in the shelter telling people where to find her. And then he just vanished into the trees. Wow. Okay. Yikes. But apparently... Ralph realized nobody may ever find Margaret, and then she would die horribly of exposure or dehydration. So he came back. (sighs) And he said, "Uh, let's hike together to the nearest road, and then we'll part ways. Let's not. And he said if Margaret tried to signal to anyone for help along the way, he would kill everyone involved. So they take this trek, and Ralph and Margaret did pass other hikers and even spoke to them, but she couldn't do anything to risk her own life, to risk their lives, so she just kept quiet. Ralph ended up going back on his promise, and he forced Margaret to hitchhike with him into a town where they got dinner and stayed together in a motel. Ew. I know! It's so unhinged! While Mm. Margaret showered in the motel, Ralph lurked in the bathroom to make sure she didn't climb out the fucking window. Oh my god! Yeah. I okay. It's wow, so I can't disturbing. imagine the fear. I can't imagine the fear. Then they hitched a ride to a Greyhound station, where Ralph bought himself a ticket to Atlanta and bought Margaret a ticket to Columbia, South Carolina. Ralph's bus left first, and once he got on the bus and left, Margaret got on her bus. When she got to Columbia, she finally was able to call the police, who connected her to Georgia police, and eventually she was able to return home. Uh, May 11th, investigators recovered Joel's body from the trail. On May 16th, investigators received a phone tip about a man who matched Ralph's description in the media. They got a search warrant to his apartment, and inside they found Joel's stolen traveler's checks, so they knew this was the guy. His name, like I said, was Ralph Fox Howard. He was 31 at the time of the murder. He had a history with the law. 
Uh, some of his other previous crimes included car theft, breaking and entering, statutory rape, then marrying the pregnant teenager <gasps> that he had raped, then attempted murder of that same teenager slash his wife now, oh. and then oh. prison break. My God. Yeah, so this guy's trouble. In 1975, he was sentenced to life in prison for Joel's murder, but in 1991, he got leave to attend his brother's funeral and was then paroled. But he didn't show up for his parole hearing, and pretty shortly after that, he murdered 29-year-old Diane Good by strangling <gasps> her in cold blood. Oh my god! And so, do we ever do we ever find out a reason for like why he like let this one go, but not before making her go all the way to like fucking South Carolina? And nope. So it's, it's just so creepy. It's like, deranged. Okay, I guess I just so gotta be okay creepy. with that. Yeah. So police caught him two days after he strangled Diane Good all the way in Washington State, and he was convicted of Diane's murder and sentenced again. He died in 2003 at a state prison hospital of lung cancer. And Joel, who was killed uh, by Ralph, his friends remember him as shy, nerdy, and kind. It surprised some of them that he was setting out on an adventure with a woman he had just met because he usually was pretty awkward and unsure around girls. But mm -hmm. he was always really kind and it won people over. One friend said he was just a friend to everybody. He was happy to be by himself and he was really happy to make other people happy. Mm. So pretty traumatic, pretty tragic uh, and for Mark, because, I mean, you hear the start of the story and you think, oh, he's going to murder her because yeah. she lies to her parents. She says, oh, I trust him. I just met him. You no, know, that, it, it what, seems that's like he's going for the sure. bad guy, but no. Oh, so for Margaret, guy. weirdly enough or like amazingly enough, the experience did not keep her out of the woods. She went on to spend several years studying in Brazil's tropical forests and earned her doctorate there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. That's nice. I, know. I mean, talk about a comeback story. She actually shared her story in 2018. And as of then, she was married with several children, several grandchildren and living in Southern Europe. She told Earl Swift of OutsideOnline.com that the memory of the incident feels like something that happened to someone else a long time ago, but she knows it very much shaped who she is now. And oh, here's a God. quote from her. I wouldn't say I've done anything all that extraordinary, but I have very much taken it to heart that I was spared for something. Maybe this experience helped me see that life is a fleeting moment. So grab it and go. Wow. Yeah. What oh my a freaking story to survive. I can't. I just also like to know that you were so close to death and probably yes. in so many ways, just because uh, of the sheer time you were next to this person. Like, yes, like the amount of t spending the night in the same room. I mean, oh my terrible. god! Like, I mean, even Joel, like he was there for a hot minute and died. And but this woman, like, maybe he just like desperately wanted to be near a woman or something. I and, don't like, know. Maybe he I have maybe no at idea. The it, it doesn't. You know, maybe there's just no logic that we can understand. Also, yeah. Also, her like probably having to like do her best to keep it together, like for like in that time period of being abducted and like having yeah, you're to stay in survival with mode but you're also trying not to freak him out because he threatened Ugh. to kill everybody if you made a signal or anything i mean god it, just the pressure alone um Oof. very very scary do you have another story yep okay uh, good. so I have how, two many, how many do we get two okay 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 so this is the second one uh this occurred in 2001 and uh, i want to warn you right now it's unsolved so we All don't right. get many answers and it's a little frustrating. Okay. So this is the unsolved case of Louise Chaput. I hope I'm saying her name right. I listened to a podcast that said it, Chaput, so I'm going to go with that. Louise Chaput was 52 years old and was a self-employed psychologist from Sherbrooke, Quebec. She owned her own practice where she offered affordable care to low-income families struggling with mental health, which I think is so cool. Oh, yeah. She specialized in family and marriage therapy, and she sometimes testified as an expert witness in youth criminal cases. Uh, outside of work, she was known as a kind woman with a sense of humor. She had two daughters, 18-year-old Corinne and 10-year-old Constance, and her family said there was no one who liked life as much as Louise. When Louise went hiking, she always took water with her, much like Linda, always <laughs> have water on hand. 
But also probably much like Linda, she also always brought along chocolate on all her hikes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Got it. So it just uh, tells you about her. Like she's responsible, but she's like, but I still want to have a good time. You know, she's going to, she's going to have a zesty moment at some yeah. point. Yeah. She's yeah. going to treat herself at some point. Yeah. <laughs> so she was the kind of person who just enjoyed the simple pleasures in life. And she especially loved the mountain Washington Valley in New Hampshire, roughly three hours from her Quebec home. And she hiked there when she could because pre-2007, you actually didn't need a passport to go between Canada and the U.S. So it was kind of an easier, like, hike. Fun fact. So Mount Washington is the highest peak in the Northeast. It's about, it's not about, it's exactly 6,288 feet at the summit. The mountain, which is considered the most dangerous small mountain in the world, interestingly enough, is notorious for its violent weather conditions, and it holds a record for the fastest wind speeds ever recorded that were not related to a hurricane or tornado, mm. which I think is okay. pretty incredible. Wow. And that was 231 miles per hour. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. Thank God. Yeah. So Louise loved the White Mountain Range. It, it was a challenge. It was a little bit dangerous, but it was also absolutely beautiful. And so on November 15, 2001, Louise decided to head to Pinkham's Grant in White Mountain National Forest and stay at Joe Dodge Lodge. Hmm. It was November, like I said, and it's considered unwise to climb Mount Washington in November. So Louise asked an employee at the Appalachian Mountain Club for short hike suggestions. So just like a sure. quick one and done, be back. That's what I would like. If I got to go hiking, yes. that's what I want. Just circle right back home and have my hot cocoa waiting for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh wait no i bring it on the trail with me no no Sorry. no. i i need it as i need to know that i have as a, a reward a, a reward yes okay 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 it was around 3 p.m and she wanted to go out and get back before dark understandably and so they sent her to what they you know considered a short hike called lost pond trail lost pond connects to the appalachian trail but most hikers hike in and straight back out it's relatively gentle it's 1.6 miles uh most people can do it in under an hour so it's just a you know short easy trek that uh she had requested sure according to all trails this is a very popular area for birding hiking and running so you'll likely encounter other people while exploring But by mid-November, peak season is long past in the White Mountains. Snow is not unusual, and fewer people are eager to set out in the cold. Uh, I remember those wind speeds. This is a tough place to be in the wintertime. Okay. So it's likely Louise was alone on the trail when she left on what should have been a short trek. But she never came back to her room at the lodge. Ooh. Okay. Okay. She was in a national forest where service is limited, so her family, at first, spent a few days thinking, well, we don't need to panic. You know, she probably doesn't have service. Sure. But when she never came home, her boyfriend reported her missing on November 19th. And after that, a major search effort was launched. The Forest Service, the Appalachian Mountain Club, park rangers, and police all set out to find her. And at first, days went by with no news until, tragically, her body was discovered on November 22nd near Glen Boulder Trail, which was a week after Louise had first set out. Mm. She had suffered multiple stab wounds, and her (gasps) throat had been cut. (gasps) Oh, my God. Wow. Yeah. Oh, but that wasn't like an accidental fall. That was an intentional Very, very brutal murder. So the Glen Boulder Trail connects to Lost Pond, and searchers found Louise only about a quarter mile from her car. So in other words, it seemed like she had been killed that day on her hike on the 15th. Mm. And in fact, strangely enough, her hiking boots were still in her car. So it wasn't like she was being... Oh, she hadn't even started hiking then yet. Yeah, but she was found a quarter mile into the hike. So people wondered maybe she was targeted as soon as she parked and was Mm. dragged Dragged. into the woods. Um, perhaps it wasn't clear what had happened. Maybe she met somebody and yeah, but her hiking boots were Hmm. still in the car. So it was, um, that was a confusing element to this. Yeah. It sounds like right away she was pulled away. So yeah, doesn't it? So there was confusion in the days following uh, a Canadian news outlet reported that police weren't sure if Louise was hiking alone, if she had been attacked at random or if someone with her were responsible Louise's backpack, sleeping bag, and car keys were missing, but investigators thought, you know, maybe the killer took them off her, or maybe the car sat unattended for a week and someone stole it. Oh, So it could be that 
the murderer had taken them, or it could be that she had been killed and then somebody just saw like just stuff the car. sitting out in the car and took it, took her stuff. You know what I mean? Sure. Either were possibilities. Um, her keys were gone weirdly, but the car was still there. So that was odd. Um, and people thought, well, what the hell is the motive here? Who would kill somebody for a sleeping bag and a backpack? Like there right. wasn't. And any- also, if you're going to take the keys, like why, why wouldn't you want the car? Or like even if it was you took the keys so that you could hide the evidence of the car, would you still drive it anywhere? Like yeah, what- it's just weird. Hmm. Maybe honestly, I wonder if like she was i don't know getting something out of her trunk someone ran up and like grabbed the keys from her car so she couldn't run away from them and then she and then dragged Mm. her away because because that would make sense why the car was still there but they didn't need the car they just wanted to drag her but why wouldn't you then just like tell her to get in her own car and drive her somewhere why would you need well i guess if you're already in the middle of nowhere that's a pretty good place to kill somebody oh yeah it's so confusing and we weren't the only ones because investigators were also at a loss. Uh, they did confirm Louise was traveling alone, so now they had no known suspect. And authorities just had to conclude it was random, senseless act of violence, which is so scary. Like, yeah. That, you just want to be in nature for a few hours. That's what it sounds like to me. It sounds like there was just someone maybe living in the woods or someone hiking nearby that just kind of lost Took it. Advantage. I don't know. I don't know. And, I mean, one theory they had is perhaps somebody she once testified against had Mm. targeted her and stalked her all the way to the mountains to seek revenge. But it seemed, like, far-fetched that she had been followed all the way into a different country and, like, didn't even notice somebody following her. But I guess it's possible. Um, Also, Louise's family couldn't even think of any enemy who might want to hurt her. Nobody they could think of had ever harassed her in the past or bothered her or even threatened her in the past. So it didn't really make sense to them. Mm. And despite the more relaxed 2001 border where you didn't need a passport, a criminal would have still had trouble crossing. It wasn't like you could just do it without any paperwork. It was just, you know, you still needed like an ID or something. Yeah. Um, there were no witnesses, no footprints. Her body had been out in the elements for days. Um, this was like pre the popularization of DNA evidence. Um, you know, it existed, but it wasn't that well known. And also, um, you know, her body had been out in the elements for so long. Okay. Well. A chief of the homicide unit said the killer or killers essentially had a week's head start on us. That meant we lost some potential evidence out there as well. Now, obviously, the news rocked the hiking community in the National Forest and along the Appalachian Trail. Canadian and U.S. media advised people to hike in groups or avoid the area completely until police found answers. Spoiler alert, they never found answers. It's now been 21 years. The case remains cold. There is no known motive, no suspect, and the killer is presumably still at large. Um, The New Hampshire Department of Justice is still encouraging anyone with any new information to please use their online tip form. Um, But it just seems like a cold case at this point. It seems like a a dead end. That's so weird. Uh, According to WMUR.com, Louise's loved ones return to the place where she died once a year, which I think is really beautiful because she loved being there. It was one of her favorite places in the world. It's still just so eerie to have to go there and know that it was where she last last was. Yeah. One friend expressed the deep need for answers, saying, I think in English, the term closure, which we don't have in French, is very appropriate. It's, you know, you never get your friend back, but at least you know what happened. And unfortunately, Mm -hmm. they have not gotten that closure. So I don't know. I don't know if they will. I I don't know if they will either. It's one of those things where we can only hope and wait, which is one of the hardest things to do, I imagine. Um, And yeah, that's that's the. Those are some deaths on the Appalachian Trail. Um, I've, I'm surprised. I feel like, I mean, you said there's 13 known deaths on the trail. I don't think 13 deaths. 13 uh, murders? I think. Hold on. 13 documented murders, yes. I don't know why you haven't done an episode where you just do all 13 yet, man. Well, you know? I think uh, I think starting off with two was of the most well-documented ones. Um Yeah was the eventually it it would be nice to to do all all of them them. yeah Yeah. just to make it a little series so oh my brother texted me back he linked me to appalachian english which is like a youtube video we love (laughs) okay and uh he said 
yeah, it's something about putting your dope in a poke and ball hooting through the hall, or I don't know. <laughs> Ball hooting. I don't know what ball hooting that's is. That's the one that I couldn't think of. Ball hooting through the holler. Uh, yeah. So that's the sentence. Sorry that in the beginning I was just trying to figure out what the hell he was saying. But um, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you, Zandy, for the last minute uh, shout out. I suppose. Or yeah. The last minute yeah. comments. Can we um, put? Let me put. I want to put this link in the show notes because it's a great YouTube video. Uh, it's okay. a guy explaining Appalachian slang, and it's like an old. It's like I think it's from the '90s or something. I don't know. It's just a beautiful thing. Um, I'm looking up ball hooten in this exact moment. Hang on, ball hooten. Oh, to lose control. Does that mean anything? Maybe it means to lose control. It's, that's what it says. Oh my god, you guys have to watch this video. I can't wait. That will be what I do later when we're done recording. I'm you gotta watch have... it. You, you and Zandy would you and Zandy would have a great time chatting about this video. Well, I was gonna say I I have oh side no... goglin. Sorry, side goglin. Thing side goglin. Yeah, that's another one. Oh, like cattywampus or something. I think so. I don't know. Um, uh, I'm just watching them talk, and they're just like saying things that are. Yeah, like uh, Wampus, like crooked. Well, my uh, usually after we record, I already have something in mind I want to eat, and I have something in mind I want to watch, and I don't have either yet. So now <sighs> I've got my thing that I need to watch. Now I just got to figure out what I'm going to eat. Some maybe dope. I'll drink some dope. That's for sure. Yeah, and maybe you'll smoke some dope. I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, if you um, are for some reason not sick of listening to us talk after two hours uh, and you are a member of Patreon, you can go hop over to our after chat that we're about to have. And we'll probably still be talking about Appalachia over there. Yeah. Who knows? Um, And I'm sorry in advance. And that's why we drink. Go ball hooting.